so beautiful. I'm gonna stay. Yeah, good luck. In films, in the very beginning, people wanted to show stuff you cannot see in real life. That's the secret of these visual effect movies. I've driven every vehicle you can think of away from every disaster you can think of and run to and from every vehicle and disaster you can think of. I can't visualize as large as this movie is. Anything that I could imagine pales into insignificance compared to what's actually being done. I walk onto the set and it's like the size of California is in blue screen. I mean, there's just blue drapery everywhere. It's fascinating. It feels a lot more like pretending than acting at times. It goes back to what we did as kids, which is there's nothing there and we're pretending there's something there. And it's kind of the reason most of us started in the first place. So it is a little bit of a throwback in that way. It's like the old joke of the script. They say, you know, there's one line and Rome burned. And you think, okay, that's one line of a page, but how do you shoot that? Every page had something like that in this movie. I don't think there's ever been a more ambitious scope for a movie. It just all seems like he's got it all in his head and this amazing team that's worked it all out. So, a lot of people who read the script said it's undoable. You know, and I always like that when people say that. It isn't, you know, because there's a solution for everything. But then they don't understand, really, that it's a lot of people in vehicles, which is doable in a way. Because what you do is you're just going to put an RV on a gimbal and shoot it in front of blue screen and then shoot a couple of helicopter shots. And then the rest will be CG. And then it's like all of a sudden feasible or an ash cloud is like kind of closing in on a, on a plane. It's done in blue screen, it's not done in real. <laughs> so that makes it feasible. We all feel that you need to create a combination of real and green screen, real and pure computer generated images. There's a certain tactile quality about movies with real big sets and real extras, and there's a difference between jumping on a green box and jumping on, on the real thing. He's got massive sets built, and so you're really just talking about the rest of the horizon is the blue screen, but you're also actually acting on huge sets. Very often with the movie, you're acting to one wall that is perfectly kind of Victorian or something, but then as soon as, if the camera kind of pans slightly to the right, it's, you know, you and me and this big thing here. And, but everything is complete, down to the last detail. The objective is that you don't ultimately know what was built, what's shot practical, what's a visual effect. We draw the whole thing and conceive of the whole thing and then talk very specifically with Roland, what do you need? And then we build models and we do little sketch up so we can move through the space and talk about it. The lines are, are actually drawn quite early in, in pre-production because we need to know budget-wise if it's gonna be a physical effects or is it gonna be a visual effects or is it gonna be a combination of both. Roland, because of his experience, he's quite clear of what he likes to see real and where he thinks that it's best for the visual effects to take over. But basically, anything that is like a real wide shot, that there's no way you would see all the destruction, and we can't duplicate that kind of destruction. It would be a visual effects, and anything tighter than uh, physical effects would, would take over. When you see these blue screens, you have no idea. I mean, you have some idea from the renderings and the script what it's gonna look like, but then there's this whole other army of people putting together this film with their computer stuff. It's pretty wild. I did many movies with Volker Engel before in Germany. I love about him that he is like very methodical and very research oriented. He has a very incredible eye for what looks real. It never seemed intimidating from the size because, let's put it this way, if it would be any other director and I would know, okay, I'm, I'm dealing with a director who might not know exactly what he wants or what's going to end up on the screen and we have to do a lot of trial and error, I would be very nervous. But especially with the history that we have, there's the feeling of somebody is covering your back. We can go to him and say, listen, I mean, I know that we have these 20 shots here, but as it's planned right now, you probably need 10 additional ones. Can we talk about this? I mean, he's not going to be an egomaniac about that and say, like, I don't care how you guys do it. It needs to be done like that. There's an open conversation all the time. So that makes it better and makes us less nervous about the workload. He is partnered with Mark Weigert. Mark Weigert is a guy who can do every one of these shots himself. So he's like kind of the technical part, the computer genius of the two. One of the biggest 
challenges that we face is actually the sheer amount of challenges that are in this movie. Obviously, we have several different types of disasters that are happening, earthquakes, floods, huge volcanic eruptions, almost atomic explosions. We have several different cities that are being destroyed, all different types of effects, and each one of these needs to be designed. We need to do research and development for things that have never been done before. So it's not a movie that's just about one single thing. We're saying, okay, if we just hit an earthquake, for instance, it would be comparatively easy. It's still not easy, but comparatively easy because what we're dealing with just one thing. And once you figure that one out, you can do it over and over again. In this movie, it's absolutely not possible. We figure one thing out and it's one scene. It's literally sometimes three lines in the script where it says, our heroes are driving through downtown as it crumbles. Um, these two together are like in incredible people to have in your movie. For some years, you know, they wanted uh, to produce their own movies, you know, they produced some movies and I couldn't have them. And, and this movie, I like just had to talk them into it. I said, look, you have to do this. One thing we talk about a lot actually in the early stages of pre-production is how to structure the size and the scale of all the events that are happening so that there's really a curve happening. It, it starts slow, more and more and more happens, more and more happens until the very end and we don't start with something that's absolutely huge and then afterwards everything else is, is kind of disappointing afterwards. So you really have to spread it out. One of the first scenes I have with Amanda, we're in a supermarket and we're having a little bit of a discussion about us and what is separating us at the moment and then in fact the ground opens up and separates us. That's that subtle approach to relationship drama. This is what I mean by pulling us apart. But it's really kind of a fun scene. And I always love scenes like that where you take this sort of really ordinary, you know, we're kind of night shopping and then wham, this thing hits. I don't, don't even know if there's any scene in the movie where we read it and thought that's it gonna be very easy to do. I think that like on every page we were thinking, oh, yeah, 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 okay. I, we'll have to figure something out. Supermarket was that same way. What do we shoot for real? And that has a lot of implications because uh, if you shoot something for real, at first you always have to think about how do you make it so it's safe for the actors? And the second thing is how can you make it so you can integrate that well later with the computer animation? So you really have to think about how do I approach this? What's the technology, what's the techniques behind it that I'm gonna do? First, it would be storyboarded. Then the next thing is we would do a computer animated version of the entire scene. So you kind of have a very good blueprint. They have extensive pre-visualizations where you can see the whole scene in a cartoon form. pre we call it. These pre they become better and better. I mean, when I kind of compared them like 10 years ago, it was like only schematics and now you can quite see how it will look. We have really three different phases. The first phase happens really on the set where you just have a couple of things shaking, maybe like a cornflakes package falling out of a shelf. Then we have a different setup where we show a lot more stuff falling and crumbling and so on. And that's where we already have our actors. They're just standing on, clinging to these little poles in front of a blue screen. Everything around them, behind them, is already computer generated. And then there's a third stage where we, where we show the aftermath of the destruction, where you see a big, huge crevasse that actually went through the supermarket, which is a uh, digital matte painting. It's one of the smaller sequences in the movie because it's really just the very beginning and it's not many shots, not as many as other three minute sequences, for instance, that we have. But still, technically, it was something where, that we really had to, had to invent how to do it. The more and more we talked about it, you know, I had this feeling, you know, I want to kind of do a big earthquake sequence in LA. And naturally, you know, you have to figure out how to do it. We knew that he has to rescue his wife and he's a limo driver. So we said, okay, this will be the limo ride through LA. And then we thought, how can you get out of LA only with a plane? So the little plane sequence was born. The ideas that he had made it also then really come to life. And when we thought about, okay, what does it mean if you have a 10.5 earthquake? I mean, a 10.5 earthquake means everything that is in your scene is shaking and breaking. Every little element has to be destroyed. So at first, when we started location scouting in Los Angeles, we thought, oh, maybe we can do it here, maybe we can do it here. And then we thought, 
No, we can't do it anywhere because if we shoot it somewhere, what we have to do is we literally have to erase everything out of the scene and then replace it with, with an animated scene. So why even bother? What we then decide is, okay, we will generate the entire environment in the computer. So once we knew that, we said, okay, now we have the freedom to do anything we want. When you talk about earthquakes, it was always done like you shake the camera and the actor was acting like the floor was shaking. And I thought, you know, that you have to go a step beyond that in a modern movie. So our effect supervisor invented the shaky floor. We've probably done some of the biggest rigs that I've ever seen. We actually built these huge decks that float and shake. They're like 8,000 square feet so that he could build his set, put cars on it, put trucks, planes, and everything would shake. And he has literally the whole two, three city blocks kind of rippling. And you're supposed to run across it and get into a car and drive off. It allows us to sort of replicate all these movements in a confined space that then they cover, you know, surround by blue screen and then they can sort of fill in the pieces later on. It's pretty amazing to watch and it really is very, very lifelike. When you're running through a house that is being shaken like there's an earthquake, it really feels like there's an earthquake. One of the kids said one day, I'm actually really scared now and I was like, I am too. We went first a little bit, so everybody got a feel for it. And it was quite frightening for the whole crew. One thing that's also very cool, which was not possible several years ago, is we're using softwares that are called physics-based software. So if you do a simulation, it's nothing that the computer just makes up. There's now so many parameters inside the software that simulate something that is absolutely for real. You don't do five, six simulations and then say like, yeah, but it actually doesn't really look like real water. We're now at a point where you simulate it and it actually really behaves like water or the building really behaves like a crumbling building. This is now actually the final pre-visualization that was done by Pixelmondo. This has already been edited by our editors. This is really for us our blueprint for the shoot, say, so, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is our basis now. From here on, every single shot that's in here will be produced by us. And uh, we're really moving from this and replacing every object that's really still like very video gamey looking and so on with higher resolution objects as soon as we have them. Literally week by week, these scenes and all the shots are getting better and better and better until we are at the final result. I'm doing. Could yeah, we exactly. possibly put an eight-foot blue screen on the on the right side here, up to the corner? We had the plan from the get-go to shoot as much as we could for real. So we had a street that was specifically built for the movie on a on a back lot and blue screen all around it. We actually shot about a dozen or so uh, shots that are also in the movie that have the real limousine in it. We built uh, several limos that had roll cages inside of them so that when we are dropping cars or ratcheting cars or throwing cars with, with air cannons in case we had hit the limo, that the limo itself would, would be protected and all the people inside of it. We ratcheted a lot of cars. We can send them tumbling like you'll see in, in the film. You see them tumbling in front of the limo as it races by them. So we're sending them 80 feet in total distance travel and we'll have a couple flips done through that. Another method is we use uh, nitrogen cannons when we have uh, a piston that we basically put high pressure gas behind it and much like a potato gun and it, it just shoots them out. And we could throw those cars, I mean, up to 300 feet away. As soon as the live action footage has been shot, as you see here, all mainly people running in front of a blue screen, then it gets assembled. Based on the original previous assembly, now the editors go ahead and actually put the live action footage in and intercut it with our pre-visualization footage. Oh, oh. We gotta get to the other side of the freeway. The amazing thing about a shot like this is, uh, is the detail that gets into this, because what you're looking at here is 100% digital shot. We didn't even shoot the limousine driving on a road and then build everything else around it. There is no element of a palm tree that was shot, let's say, in front of a blue screen. Every single piece you see, for example, the collapsing freeway on the left side actually has rebar in it, which makes the freeway behave exactly like a real freeway would behave in an earthquake. Watch it, watch it. I have to get to 85. 
And the plane sequence, in terms of that it's in a plane, makes it a slight bit easier because you don't have any direct interaction with the ground. And it's, I mean, it's, it's almost a minor thing, but still, in terms of visual effects, in terms of computer animation, it makes a little bit of a difference because if, if you have a limousine, uh, you know, it has very clear interaction with everything that happens on the ground. Of course, those kind of problems you don't have with a plane. But on the other hand, also, I mean, this plane is also flying through a lot of stuff as it's flying through the two high-rises that are crumbling together. It's being hit by little debris and glass and so on, and there's interaction there too, and Roland would come up with new ideas. And one of the things that, that he noticed fairly early on is that it needs this really big bang at the end. And just originally it was planned to just fly with the plane out of downtown. You know, it'd see it more crumbling, and that was it. But he's not happy with that. That's not enough. Just seeing entire Los Angeles downtown crumbling, that's for wussies. We have to do more. We have to do better than that. It's a team that makes some shelves, and they all sink in the ocean. And I always said, well, how would that look? And then they just mock it up, and then you say, yeah, that is it. It's a process. A lot of times you just say to people, just to make a drawing of it, and then we see if this works. And then out of the drawing comes another idea, and slowly you evolve a whole sequence. The volcano sequence was from the very beginning, you know, we said, okay, uh, we'll shoot some stuff on location. We have a second unit there, which shoots a lot of the camper, and then the rest of the beach done on stage. You can imagine in the purely Roland Emmerich style what kind of stuff is going to be going on, and it's going to be huge. But when you're acting it, it's really hard to visualize all this stuff going down, so I tried to be as over the top as possible, which might place me just right in the pocket. There's a huge amount that was done practical in this sequence. It's helicopter footage while the RV is driving on the roads. In the beginning, we had a discussion with Mike Rosina how much he would be able to show of lava bombs impacting around the RV next to the road. We actually made some of these fiery rocks. We used one of those guns that fired the, the cars, but actually made a rock that was 10 feet in diameter and then lit it on fire and then shot it out. But we figured out pretty fast that that's a very impractical solution because you don't want to create any forest fires. So we decided early on to do that actually in, in CG. We're working with Double Negative, the company that actually does the final shot, all the digital elements of it very closely on this. What they do next is they deliver what we call the post-viz and they implement a rough version of all those lava bombs that, that come down. All these gray columns that you see um, are the lava bombs hitting and eventually each one of them is, is going to have a great impact. So here's the same shot again now with the final lava bombs first hitting the water and then a big piece of soil crashing and leaving this, this big dust trail on impact here. The closer you get the harder it is to make it believable because right now with, with all these big impacts here you start to seeing all the detail. You, you, you basically you get down to grains of sand in the end uh, so it's, it's, it's big pieces but well, it's also very small pieces. So you see actually the camera is going through one of these impacts here. There's a specific moment when the RV gets hit by one of these lava bombs, and that's where the RV was prepared by the special effect crew. We had it all rigged with pyro, and the whole back end is one of these comets, or these fiery rocks, we call them, would hit the back end and explode and take the RV out. And then we only in post over the course of maybe like two frames or so added this lava bomb that actually hits the RV. Finally get to the airport, we see the landing strip and out of nowhere this gigantic crack shows up and creates this huge gap that they have to pass. Our special effect and stunt team set up this ramp for the real RV to jump over. Basically we redid all the suspension on it that could basically take a quite a bit of a 20 foot gap jump and then land on the other side another 60, 70 feet away. We had some special seats made so that the, the drivers could actually not compress their spine when they actually landed on, on the other side. It was very important that Double Negative built their landscape in a way that would be a natural ramp for the RV to jump over. So when this crack happens and everything is buckling up, there is actually a 
a natural ramp that, that is coming up. So it, it actually makes sense that they would make it over. It's not just flat ground and they would just hit the other side and fall in. All right, buckle in, here we go! John Cusick finally makes it into the airplane. It's already taxiing on the runway, and they lift off, but the whole pyroclastic cloud finally catches up to them. As you see, there's pretty much nothing. This was a plate that was shot from a helicopter in, in Canada at this location that we had there. And now you have to create the shot out of that. In the final shot, everything comes together, and you see especially all the detail work on the ground level here and some of these trees being you know bending over from the pressure wave before they actually get totally thrown over by the the actual cloud i think they did a great job on having this additional element of, of this this pressure wave actually preceding the uh the cloud itself and and swirling up all this all these pieces we expect the tsunamis to reach landfall in every continent. There was like always this image in my head, you know, that water comes over the Himalaya. I said, if there's a global flood, you know, that will like kind of tell the end of the world has come. I did this before in Day After Tomorrow, but not to that extent. It was the only sequence I was really nervous about, because there you hand your destiny pretty much over to some visual effect people. We found uh, this uh, German company uh, called Scanline. And I saw their work and I said, I think they can do it. And, and, and Volker and Mark thought so too. They're the only ones right now that literally can turn around water, not only fast and efficient, uh, but also fantastic looking. The one thing you have to keep in mind with water is that water is always in several different states. You have the main body of water, which is you know, a big, almost firm mass that moves fairly slowly. Then it creates this white water, which are these crests of wave, which is a foamy, totally different thing. And then out of that comes this gas, literally, that is that is like these thin trails of dust, the water spray, actually, that come out of it. So you're dealing with these three different types, and literally it has to get from one state to the other, to the other, seamlessly. And that is still extremely challenging and uh, they've managed to, to really uh, master that and uh, done an absolutely phenomenal job. It's still mind-bugging to me how fast they were churning out new versions. Water is like a mathematical problem. It's incredibly render-intensive and, and because of that you do first a very sim simple simulation and then you upgrade that simulation more and more into the full thing and that takes a lot, a lot of time. At one point we discussed we have to do something about the White House and we were like kind of very aware of that uh, I destroyed the White House before so I said like well if you don't destroy it it's also not good. So we tried to figure out a way how to destroy it in a new way and I was at that time like reading a lot about the Kennedys and all of a sudden it hit me I had this idea that the aircraft carrier like John F. Kennedy smashes into the White House and I don't know what excited me about that but I realized this was a stunning visual and also had this slight ironic kind of feel to it like uh, John F. Kennedy returns to the White House. You see shots that are coming in and you think yeah that's exactly what I thought it would be and then you see shots you think yeah. I was hoping for better, so we've got to work on this for a few months. Um, and then some of you see stuff where you think, oh goodness, this is even better than I thought. This is absolutely fantastic. And we had that a couple times, and the Washington uh, destruction of the tidal wave was one of those, where really when we first saw that, just slowly the, uh, the aircraft carriers coming out of the mist towards us, and then we saw the shot where it actually gets carried by the wave, and we thought, oh yeah, that is really going to be cool. fun thing about 2012, definitely for us, was that you now have the means to put you as an audience right in the middle of everything. Several years ago, we couldn't have done it at all. It's a totally different thing, something you've, you've never seen before. It's easy to talk about it afterwards when it's done than during the time when we do it. You see disaster on a scale that you've never seen before.
you will see stuff within those disasters that you've never seen before. I mean, I personally have never been in a 10.5 earthquake where the concentric waves of the earthquake are rippling right behind me and lifting up houses and trees and, you know, crumbling high-rises. Pretty much now in, in CG technology destroy any building, any landscape you want. It gives you like a new freedom, you know, and I, I really use that to the max. And it was also a little bit the fun of it. Maybe I said like, okay, this one will be the last one. So I do everything what's human possible. So, so I, I don't have ever to go back there again. And action. It's pretty epic and massive, even more than his other movies, I think. He's the master of imagination and ingenuity from Independence Day to 10,000 BC. He can go on and on. He's a visionary, he's a storyteller. And he likes to do it in, in a grandiose way. And then here, you know, we like to do the same thing. He certainly is a master of suspense and crazy action sequences. I think Roland's incredible in this genre and has made so many films that are kind of so arresting and engaging. Let's do it again. It's something about the way Roland puts a film together. You just go with it. And there's some outrageous stuff that happens, but you go with it. He's a master craftsman that way. But he has the problem, the tension is like really seriously injured. So he wants to have him come help him. I can't understand how he sleeps at night. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I don't know what it would be like to be in charge of something this huge. A normal director, you'd look at the scope of this and you'd see somebody pulling their hair out and having a nervous breakdown trying to manage all this. <laughs> Cut! It's like a Wizard of Oz concept. You know, you think it's going to be this rawr, kind of guy who's just extremely tough and brutal. Extremes in every in every respect. Hundreds of people, gallons of water, fire, everything. And Roland is the most relaxed, well-adjusted, nice, easygoing dude. It is truly remarkable. The music starts. Any minute. In any minute now, the firework gonna start. It's like a kid on set, you know? He just loves this kind of stuff. He loves telling these stories, and you can just kind of see the, the joy and excitement every day at work with him. It really doesn't get old. I keep waiting for him to get tired, but he's sort of more exuberant each day. There's very few people that have an eye like him to sort of put these stories in this grand scale together bit by bit by bit. When we see the shelves nicely shaking, they can already start falling. We start saying action and action at full. It seems so effortless for him, whether it's the top of Yosemite or LA city street with buildings falling and it just all seems like he's got it all in his head. What makes it so wonderful is this, the way he pays attention to details. Every single thing is that I've noticed on the set is specific. There's no generalities around it. The emotional danger that each of the characters go through, as well as the physical dangers that they are challenged by, are very important for him. Roland's got it going on. He knows every nuance, every little moment he wants to see happen. Nothing can happen because we only go a little bit. Yeah. And you will hold on to this. And then we harness you to this whole thing. So nothing can happen. Cool. I don't even know what a damn gimbal is. He <laughs> feel me? She <laughs> said, you're going to get the gimbal and go, OK, cool, let's do it. You know, but I understand what he wants to see happen in terms of uh, the action and the story. I think he really offers a lot of room for the creativity of the actors and just for the other people who are part of the production, which I think everyone appreciates. I do. Some of the great yogis in history have said that <laughs> breathing in is birth and breathing out is 
Yeah. <laughs> right now we're gonna have a whole universal exhale. <laughs> For movies like this, you want to work with directors who can paint with the big brush and the small brush at the same time. I knew that Roland could definitely paint with the big brush, but I've been much more impressed with his ability to kind of zero in on the details. For him, it's not just about you know blowing things up at all. He's very interested in the people and understands that it's the relationships that ultimately make these movies. Independence Day, that was the first time I like kind of the big destruction and we like kind of used actually the form of a disaster movie, you know, to kind of tell an alien invasion. And since then, I realized that in the disaster movie format, you have like kind of two things. You have very big images, and you have very small, intimate stories. That's a great combination and I'm like just fascinated by that. And in this case, I had this idea to do a modern retelling of Noah's Ark. At that time, it was not really fully a disaster movie, but then we discovered there's like one theory in the 50s, Earth Crust Displacement, which leads to a global flood, and that came with a lot of disaster scenarios, and through that it kind of became a disaster movie. Tell me where to kneel, Roland. This side? Here. Yeah. Here? No, no, where you are. Where, where, where you are. You want me to kneel here? So like kind of really comes between you guys. Okay. I was not sure if I should do another disaster movie, but the more I talked about it, the more I realized this is a too good an idea that I have to, I have to do this. And then I also said to myself, you know, you have so much experience in this, and I knew that like kind of now everything can done in CG, and I wanted to be just the one who does it. It's just so visual. He just has the whole movie in his hand, every frame, which is quite mind-boggling for me sometimes to talk to somebody who at all time knows what the next cut, the next frame, the next word is. Roland is constantly excited by the physical challenges of being able to take what's on the page and put it on the screen. And I think he's done so remarkably well. Even go one step back, one step back because then, you, then I can remove you. Or, or, or like this. That's good. Yeah, that's good. good. He's certainly done a couple of pictures about a lot of things falling apart. And I think it's interesting that he's really created a certain genre, you know, out of a genre that was pretty prevalent, I think, for a while, and then not so much. And, uh, and I think he's really kind of brought it back over the last sort of 10 years or so and really pushed everything. This is his canvas. This is what he does best. I mean, I think better than anybody since, you know, Irwin Allen and Poseidon Adventure, Towering Inferno. I mean, Roland makes these movies. The one thing that Roland does differently than other filmmakers is that whatever he does always has a different angle to it and has a bigger scale than anywhere else that you've seen before, Independence Day. There have been similar things like that before, like the, the, the television series V, for instance, where also big spaceships were hovering, but you've never seen anything in that scale, that enormity, and that, you know, so, so breathtaking as the stuff that, you know, was done in Independence Day. I think that when the big wave hit New York in the day after tomorrow, when the water came down Fifth Avenue, that was something that people had never seen before and I think that's what's so spectacular about Roland is his imagination allows him to go to places which in some ways you would say well that that could never happen and maybe it could and maybe it couldn't it doesn't matter people want to be entertained people want to be sort of blown out of their seats and I think that nobody does that better than Roland the energy that he has making his movies and especially his disaster movies stems from a passion for for this since he's been a child and since he's picked up a Super 8 camera. There's a passion about that that he had when he was, you know, 16, 17. And still to this day, I know it, I sit next to him when he's in his director's chair. You can see the sparkle in his eyes going like, I can't believe they let me do this. If you're dizzy, disoriented, dizzy, disoriented. You know, I'm the first audience member, and when it doesn't work for me on the day, you know, I'm like kind of trying so long until I like it. I always have like some sort of an inner image, and you have to find it, and that makes it interesting and fresh. And disaster movies I like so much because it's about characters, normal, regular people like you and me, who have to face life and death situations, and because of that, we evaluate their life. The genre is a lot of the weaving storylines, which then all at the end come together. He's interested in making movies that have some moral tale to them. 
and I think that's what makes his movies successful. It's certainly what makes him engaged and interested in the movies that he makes. It's not just the challenge of how am I going to mount this, and certainly that's fun. It's fun to figure out how you're going to bring what's on the page to the screen. But I think for Roland, one of the things, if not the most important thing, is to say, why is this story worth being told? And what he's able to do is tell stories that are meaningful to him within the backdrop of this giant canvas. It's a little bit naturally when you were successful with something, you know, you like kind of keep uh, doing it because first of all, you like it. You know, and Hitchcock was the thriller guy and Woody Allen is the walking through Manhattan with funny lines guy. It's just these things, they stick. But I did also The Patriot, and I have a lot of other movie ideas. Not one of my other projects right now is a disaster movie, because this will be it, <laughs> trust me. And cut.